Uh, this is the fourth in a series of messages called Can We Trust the Bible? Uh, let's review, first of all, uh, why s- uh, so many people do not believe the Bible. Uh, one, they begin with an anti supernatural bias. Uh, they believe that in naturalism, that all there is is what we can see and, and touch. And so when we read about miracles in the Bible, they must be inauthentic, made up uh, by the authors to kind of make Christianity appear more uh, exciting. Second reason is there's an assumption that people of faith do not record history accurately. They begin with uh, the, the thought that only in the last couple of centuries have we learned how to write history accurately. Ancients would just kind of make stuff up and call it history. Third reason uh, many do not believe the Bible is because there's a mass ignorance of the Bible. Never before have so many people grown up without ever reading the Bible. It's never brought up in their home. They haven't been to church. And so when somebody says the Bible's not true, what are they going to say? How are they going to refute that? A final reason is the reason is because there's a desire for the Bible not to be true so that we can live however we want. I found this to be the case often with atheists who travel the world talking about, you know, why we don't believe in God. And uh, you say, well, did science kind of make you come to this uh, belief? No. It turns out it's more like they don't want it to be true so they can live however they want. You may be someone who believes the Bible's not true. Uh, It's just an interesting book of stories and advice. Uh, Whether you're a teenager, single, married, parent, or grandparent, one of the most important decisions you make is what you believe about the Bible. I want to show you that you can believe the Bible is true. I want to share with you six reasons that you can believe the Bible is true. One, the claims of the Bible. Now, any ancient book... We start with the assumption when we open it and read it that it's true unless it proves itself false. So if you're reading Plato, you assume that you're reading Plato and it's actually what he wrote and it's true. Well, the Bible's an ancient document as well. We assume it's true unless it proves itself false. I've never found the Bible to prove itself false, so we assume that what it says is true. It claims that all of the Bible is God-breathed. God inspired it through the human authors so that they wrote without error. Now, the second reason we can believe the Bible is true is the documentary evidence. Uh, The documentary evidence we have for the Bible is way stronger than any other ancient document. Uh, We have uh, nine copies of Euripides' writings, the oldest, uh, latest arguments uh, or uh, manuscripts are like 1,500 years after he's written. So there's a gap of 1,500 years between Euripides wrote and the earliest manuscript we have. Um, by contrast, the Bible, uh, the New Testament, we have 24,000 documents. The more documents you have, you can compare them, and let's say one has a sentence and another one has a sentence, but one word's missing. You can say, well, would the author add this word, or is it more likely the scribe in copying it skipped this word? And you can draw the conclusion that this was the original document. Um, And then the documents we have for the Bible are older, like in the New Testament, the earliest ones are papyrus, and they're like 50 years after when Christ died. That's a very short gap between other ancient documents. So it's without parallel, the documentary evidence. The third reason we can believe the Bible is true is the scientific evidence, and by that I mean archeology. span Over the last uh, 200 years, many uh, archaeological finds have, have, have shown the Bible to be true. Uh, has anything been found in archaeology that proves the Bible untrue? Not once. And so with oh, time and, and you know, uh, I think I told you last week, uh, Professor Wellhausen uh, said, I'm going to say 100 years ago, we have 1,500 errors in the Bible. 
He says, now thanks to archaeology, we've whittled that number down to 50. Now, even with the 50, you know, I, I continue to say, we have to continue to study it and figure out if we can figure it out. You know, why? Uh, so archaeology has proved over and over again that what the writers in the Bible said, that's actually the way it was. Fourth reason we can believe the Bible is true is the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. We have 48 prophecies in the Old Testament. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew that were prophesied, that were fulfilled by Christ in the New Testament. The chances of one person fulfilling all 48 of those is like, you know, one in a million times a million times a million. Uh, and then there are many other prophecies prophesied and then fulfilled in the Old Testament. Um, they demonstrate that the Bible has to be a supernatural document inspired by God. Now today I want to share with you the most important reason you can believe the Bible is true. The teaching of Jesus. Why is this so important? What makes Jesus teaching so important? And how do we know that the teaching of Jesus that we have is in the New Testament is actually what he said? So let's start with the second question. How do we know that what's recorded in the Gospels is an accurate portrayal of what Jesus actually said? Lee Strobel was a journalist for the Chicago Tribune. Uh, he first met Leo Carter when Leo was a 17-year-old who had grown up in one of the grittiest neighborhoods in Chicago. Chicago has more murders per year than any other city in our country. And... Uh, Leo had a 38 caliber slug in his skull uh, as a result of uh, standing up uh, for the truth. Uh, he saw Elijah Baptist gun down a local grocer. He and his friend were playing basketball when Elijah Baptist uh, shot uh, the grocer. When he, uh, this grocer was one that had given their family food when they didn't have any food to eat. When he went to the hospital and learned that uh, the grocer had died, he knew he would be, have to give testimony in the trial. Uh, eyewitness testimony is very compelling. When a person's in a trial and, and the lawyer says, is the person who committed this crime here and you can point to the person? It's enough to put a person in prison, maybe for life. Well, Elijah Baptist knew that if he was to avoid prison, he had to get rid of Leo Carter and his friend. And so he, he and his friends went on the hunt. One day they found him walking down the street with Leo's brother, Henry. And they took them at gunpoint into a darkened uh, alley. And uh, uh, Leo said, or, uh, Elijah said to Leo, you know, I like you, but I got to do this. And he shot him right in the head. It went through his eye and blinded his left eye. And he crumpled to the ground. And then he heard a second shot and it landed two inches from his spine. And he watched as Elijah killed his brother and his friend. Elijah assumed that Leo was dead, but Leo actually was still alive and he was able to pull himself to safety, got to the hospital, and amazingly, he survived. Slug was still in his head, caused headaches so bad that even medication couldn't, couldn't stop it. But he was healthy enough to be at the trial and his testimony was enough to put Elijah Cummins in prison for 80 years. He was also the witness, the eyewitness in the trial of the slaying of his brother and his friend. And he put, it was his testimony put all three of them away for life. Eyewitness testimony is powerful. And it's equally important in determining the historicity of ancient documents. Is eyewitness testimony enough to demonstrate to us that Jesus Christ really lived and died and rose again and is the Son of God. So let me tell you what we have, what we know about the New Testament. Uh, 
We know that the gospel, or or the, the book of Acts was written by Luke, and it's the story of the life of Paul. There's nothing in the book of Acts about Paul's death. So we are confident that the book of Acts had to be completed by 62 AD. Well, the book that comes before Acts is the book of, is the Gospel of Luke. So that had to be completed by 61 AD. When we look at Luke, we can tell that Luke is depending partly on the Gospel of Mark. So we believe the Gospel of Mark was written and finished by 59 AD. When we get to the Gospel of Matthew, the theme of Matthew is that Jesus is the Messiah, the fulfiller of Old Testament prophecies. But Matthew doesn't say anything about the fall of Jerusalem, one of the greatest prophecies in the Old Testament. It would be highly unlikely, since that is his theme, that he wouldn't mention that unless his book was completed sometime in the 60s. And then the Gospel of John, likewise, says nothing about the fall of Jerusalem. Be very peculiar for him not to mention that. So we believe John was written by 70 AD. So, putting it all together, uh, we don't know exactly the date of Jesus' death. Maybe 30 AD, maybe 33 AD. But assuming he died in 33 AD... That means Mark's gospel was completed 26 years after Jesus' death. Luke's gospel is 28 years after, and Matthew and John no more than 37 years after his death. That means they wrote when there were plenty of eyewitnesses still walking around. Like Mary, we believe, would have been 73 when Mark's gospel was finished. She knows all about the life of Christ and his birth. And so these people, if what these writers wrote is wrong, they could say, wait a minute, I was there. That's not the way it happened. But we don't have any account of any eyewitness saying, no, it's different from that. So they're written early enough that we have eyewitness testimony of their truth. So if you go to Powell's bookstore, pick out a biography of some important person. The way it's going to go is pretty, pretty, you can pretty much guess how it's going to go. They're going to start with the birth, childhood, high school years, college, and then their adult years. But Mark and John skip the birth of Christ in his childhood. They go straight to the last three years of Jesus' life. And half of their gospels are dealing with the last week of Jesus' life. Matthew and Luke talk about the birth of Christ, but they too spend half of their gospel talking about the last week of Jesus' life. Why? Because they realize if Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead, there would be nothing for them to write about, no reason to document his life. It wouldn't have mattered. I've told you this several times. The Bible doesn't begin with the book of Genesis. It begins with the empty tomb. It's because he was raised that people wrote about his life and the whole New Testament was written. So if you grant that Jesus predicted his death and burial and resurrection and then he pulled it off, that demonstrates that he's the son of God. And now I'm going to believe whatever he taught all day long. So Jesus not only demonstrated he was the son of God by being raised from the dead, he also taught that he was the son of God. In Mark 6, 50, he says, because they all saw him and were terrified, immediately he spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I. In the Greek, it's ego eimi. It's the same term that God the Father used for himself in the Old Testament. I am, it is I. Jesus took the same title for himself. In John 8, 58, very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Ego eimi. Takes the same title for himself that 
God the Father did. In Mark 14, 62, Jesus is being uh, tried by the uh, Sanhedrin. And the, the, the uh, chief priest, uh, Caiaphas, asked him, are you the son of God? Did you really claim that? And Jesus answers, I am. And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. Some people think son of man signifies that Jesus is human. And son of God means that he's divine. But son of man is an Old Testament term of, of the Messiah actually coming from God and being the son of God. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? Jesus had just claimed that he was the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 7. He says, you've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death because he was claiming to be the son of man coming with the clouds. In other words, the Messiah, the son of God. Here's, here's Daniel 7. In my vision, Daniel says, at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he approached the ancient of days, that's God the Father, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. That has been fulfilled now. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, he predicted his death and resurrection, and then he pulled it off. So we believe whatever he taught. So what did Jesus teach about the Bible? He teaches, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. The law refers to the first five books of the Old Testament. The prophets refer to everything else. I haven't come to abolish them. I've come to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So Jesus taught that every dot on an I, every cross of a T is inspired by God. It's not just the meaning of the Bible that's inspired, it's every word. He said in Matthew 19, 4 to 5, haven't you read? He replied that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. He's quoting Genesis 2, 24, first book in the, in the Old Testament, and that's, we believe, written by Moses. And he's saying what Moses wrote, he's saying that those are God's words. So he's basically saying that what we find in Genesis is God's word. In Matthew twenty two forty three, Jesus tells us, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, David wrote the Psalms. So Jesus is saying what we find in the Psalms are inspired by the Spirit. What David wrote was inspired by the Spirit. Speaking by the Spirit calls him Lord. For he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your foot. Jesus says in Mark 12, 26, now about the dead rising. Have you not read? Uh, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. So he's responding to a question they give. Have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So again, he equates what we find in Moses' writing is the word of God. And the whole argument he makes it turns on I am the God of rather than I was the God of Abraham. He's saying that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive in heaven. I am their God. In other words, he's saying every word of scripture is inspired by God. Jesus asks in John 10, 34, is it not written? He asks this question over and over again. Scripture cannot be broken. He appeals to the scripture as the final authority. Uh, Jesus uh, uh, referred to uh, his, uh, ancient uh, uh, people in the Old Testament as factual. He verified the uh, historicity of Old Testament stories, some of them that are the hardest to believe. He acknowledged that Adam and Eve were real people. In Matthew 19, he affirms that uh, Noah was a historical person in Luke 17. 
He taught that Jonah was a real prophet in Matthew 12. He authenticated God's destruction of Sodom in Luke 17. He acknowledged the historicity of Isaiah, Elijah, Daniel, Abel, David, Moses, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. H.J. Cadbury, a professor at Harvard Seminary, Harvard is one of the most liberal seminaries in our country. He declared he was far more sure as a mere historical fact that Jesus held to the common Jewish view of an infallible Bible. So he didn't agree with Jesus, but he says there's no doubt you can't argue that Jesus didn't believe that the Bible was God's inspired word. Adolf Harnick, another liberal theologian, probably the greatest uh, church historian of modern times, insists that Christ was one with his apostles, the Jews, and the entire early church in complete commitment to the infallible authority of the Bible. He says, there's no doubt about it. Jesus believed that the Bible was infallible, the inspired word of God. Uh, Jesus uh, decried the loss of uh, authority, a biblical uh, belief in, in, in biblical authority in his day. We're experiencing a loss of authority today, not only for God's word, but also for people in positions of authority like pastors, priests, presidents, police officers. Some people, no, no matter how hard they try, can't seem to get any respect. A pope and a lawyer went to heaven, and they were met by... St. Peter, and uh, they went to see their room, so they first went to the Pope's room, and it was just a little cubicle, just a bed and desk and a little lamp and a chair. Then they went over to see the lawyer's room, and they were ushered into this huge, spacious room, all these sofas and a big flat screen TV, and the Pope says, I don't get it. I've served God my whole life. I'm the Pope. How come I just get a little tiny room, and this lawyer gets a huge room? And Peter says, hey, you got to understand, we've got lots of popes here. But it's not every day we get a lawyer. <laughs> if we believe Jesus is Lord, the Son of God, then we have to show respect for what he taught. So your belief in the Bible is not just showing what you believe about the Bible, it's showing what you believe about Christ. The sixth reason we can believe the Bible is true is its life-transforming power. Thousands of people through the years have found that when they put their trust in Christ and believe the Bible is true and spend time in it, they discover its life-transforming power. They discover that the scriptures work with power in their lives. Isaiah writes, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. This is speaking for God. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As rain and snow come down from heaven, do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes forth from my mouth. Now listen to this. It will not return to me empty, so whenever God's word is read, maybe you, you hear it in a, in a sermon or maybe in a Bible study or in your own life reading it, it will not return to me empty. It has life transforming power, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Some people ask how the 66 books in the Bible, the 39 in the Old Testament and the 27 in the New Testament were chosen. Why were these included in the canon and not some other books that we call apocryphal books? Well, the answer is that these books just kind of demonstrated themselves to be inspired by God, supernatural in nature. When the canon was finalized, these books were already being read by followers of Christ. And they said, these are powerful. And some of the other books didn't show themselves to have supernatural power. And uh, another criteria was an Old Testament book had to be written by a prophet and a New Testament book had to be written by an apostle. So, so what? So the Bible's inspired by God. What difference does it make? So the Bible claims to be God's infallible word. 
so we have excellent, excellent documentary evidence, better than any other ancient document. So we have scientific evidence, archaeology, that the Bible is true. We have many prophecies that have been fulfilled, showing the Bible to be supernatural. Jesus taught that the entire Bible is God's inspired word. And the Bible shows itself to have supernatural power. What difference does it make? It means that the Bible should be our final authority in life. Joshua 1.8 says, Joshua writes, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. We're supposed to spend time reading it and thinking about it so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. The inspiration of scripture is an empty doctrine if we do not read it and allow its power to work within us. If you believe God's Word is true. Do you read it? Do you study it? There's no question that the scriptures were the final authority in Christ's life. The question is, are the scriptures the final authority in your life? George Barna, a religious pollster, puts out his top 10 discoveries every year. And last year, he, he uh, stated that only 19% of Christians are Bible engaged. By that he means they read the Bible four or more times a week. It doesn't really matter if we believe that the Bible is God's inspired word if we don't read it, if we don't spend time in it. Leslie Flynn in her book, Man Ruined and Destroyed, tells this true story. A preacher uh, on Saturday afternoon was showing some boys his uh, sermon, his Bible lesson, and he had his Bible there, and he showed them, you know, where, what he was going to read from, and he was the type that would leave it there on Saturday, you know, Saturday night, and he'd come up Sunday, and it's ready to go. So the boy, he showed them where he was going to read in the Bible, so the boys came back a little later, and they glued the pages that he was going to be reading, he glued them together. So when he read it, this is what he read. And Noah, when he was 120 years old, took unto himself a wife who was, and turning the page, 300 cubits long, <laughs> 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high, <laughs> built of gopher wood, <laughs> and pitched within and without with pitch. So puzzled, he reads it, and he goes back and he turns the page again and he reads it again. He gets done. He says, folks, I have been through the Bible many times, but I have never seen this before. <laughs> now, here's my point. This is a, a humorous story, but that's the position I hold. If I find something in the Bible that appears to be like a mistake or an error like Professor Wellhausen 100 years ago said, we have 1,500 errors in the Bible. But thanks to archaeology, we've whittled that number down to 50. 50 that we still don't understand how to solve. They appear to be a discrepancy. My position is, I still believe the Bible is fully true, reliable in all it says, and we simply have to study longer to figure out with those, those final 50 what's going on. For example, Matthew 26, 34, Jesus prophesied that Peter would deny him before the cock crowed. In Mark 14, 30, Jesus said Peter would deny him before the cock crowed twice. So critics say, well, which is it? Did Matthew get it right and Mark wrong or the other way? Well, to prove that either one of them had it wrong, you have to prove that Jesus didn't say it twice. How about this? Jesus says, Peter, you're going to deny me before the cock crows. And Peter says, oh, no, 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 no. You can count on me. And Jesus responds, truly, I tell you, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows twice. So if you believe the Bible is true, are you reading it? We did a survey in October. Here's what we found. 
35.5% of people in our church read the Bible four times a week. That's what George Barna calls Bible engaged. 35.4% read the Bible two to three times a week. So our hope this year is that we can get, if you're reading the Bible just a couple times a week, if we can get bump you up to four or more times a week. We found that 10% of you are reading our journal uh, four or more times a week. 12.7 of you said that you're reading our journal two to three times a week. So we can get those of you that are just using it two or three times a week to bump up to four or more times. We found that 23.6% of our church read the, another journal uh, four plus times a week, some other kind of Bible study, and 20% read another journal two to three times a week. If we can go get those that are using another journal to, that are using it just a, two or three times a week to bump up to four or more times, we have like over 70% of our church Bible engaged, as George Barner would describe it. After studying the life of Christ, it becomes crystal clear that Jesus believed the entire Bible was inspired by God. These are the words of God. The final authority in his life. The question is, is the scripture the final authority in your life? Have you ever given your life to Christ? If you haven't, you can do so right now as we pray. You can also commit your life to say, okay, God, I believe the Bible's true. This year, I want to spend more time, four or more times a week, reading it, spending time with you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what we learned, that Jesus taught that all of the Bible is inspired by you and fully reliable. And because of that, we want to commit ourselves this year to spending time in it, hearing from you. So if you want to commit your life to Christ, you can do so right now. I'll give you a minute to pray. If you want to make a commitment to God and say, God, I'm going to, I'm going to take this more seriously, that I'm going to read your, uh, the Bible uh, more often this year. Try to be really regular at it. You pray right now. Thank you, God, that you not only communicated to us through nature, we can see your handiwork, and not only have sent your son into the world so we can see what you're like, but you've given us a, a book a word from you so we can know about you and your son and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.